Good morning, Miss Michelle. Can you hear me? Great. We're going to be beginning in about two minutes. I signed on a little earlier this morning. We have a new feature that we're trying this morning. Uh, it is a dial-in number. I hope that you can see it on the screen. Um, it is a uh, dial-in number for the United States, 1-888-958-7200. And the access code is 4080931103. Um, I hope that you can see that in the, in the column this morning. Um, I will I'll try to add it to my comment section just in case you cannot see it. Okay, great. We've got about a minute before we begin. Good morning, Sister Gloria. Good morning, Sister Ramona. How are you both? Good morning, Sister Cunningham. How are you? Pray that you are well. Good morning, and welcome to the Saturday morning breakfast Bible study of the Patton Memorial Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. I am Pastor Lydia Spragan, and I am glad to have you with me on today. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you so much for what you have done and for what you are doing in our lives. We pray, Lord, that today will be no exception, that you will keep your word as you always do. Come now, Holy Spirit. Send your presence among us. Teach us what you would have us to know. And then, Father, let our lives be transformed by what we have heard. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Reverend Olivia. I'm glad to see you were able to sign on this morning. We are in the book of Jude, and I just want to go back for a couple of minutes and go over a few things that we have covered to make sure that we are on the same page. Jude is the 65th book of the Bible. It's right before the last book of the Bible, Revelation. It is approximately a page or less long, depending on um, the format of your Bible. Jude is written for a specific purpose, and he is urging us to contend for the faith to not be swayed by every doctrine. In fact, the book of Jude is about the word apostasy. A-P-O-S-T-A-S-Y. I don't know if I mentioned this word before, but it is a word that we need to understand if we are going to read the book of Jude. The problem in the book of Jude is that false teachers had invaded the church. This wasn't the first time for this problem or the last. 
and in strong sweeping terms, Jude describes the history, the character, and the fate of these unnamed men. These names weren't important. Every age has them in one form or another. Recognizing that they exist and the dire consequences of failing to deal with them is the beginning of the solution. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They came from the inside. They were counterfeits. They looked good. They fit in. However, they were not for real. They are godless men who changed the grace of our Lord into a license for immorality and denied Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Godless describes their character. Godlessness was not so much an intellectual denial of God as a practical disregard for him. God was not in their teachings, their ministries, nor their hearts. In theological terms, Jude is warning us not to commit apostasy. A-P-O-S-T-A-S-Y. Apostrophe is described as a willful falling away from or rebellion against Christian truth. Apostasy is a rejection of Christ by one who has been a Christian. Apostasy, apostasy is the opposite of conversion. It's deconversion. Apostasy doesn't happen all at once. Apostasy takes time. Let's look at it in Psalms 1 1. Still keep up with, with uh, Jude, but we want to turn to Psalms 1. Verse 1. And here we read, and I'm reading from the New King James Version today. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners nor sits in the seat of scoundrels. Now, this is what is called a downward spiral. A downward spiral. First he is walking, then he's standing, and then he sits. Then he's in the council, then he's in the path. And then he's in the seat. Then he's of the ungodly. He's in the council of the ungodly. And then he's in the path of sinners. So he's going downward from ungodly people to people who are outright sinners. And then he's going to sit in the seat of the scornful. The scornful. Those are those who are an outright really against God, and they make no bones about it. It's a downward spiral. Another way of putting it is this. Um, and we're not saying you, you, you are committing apostasy, but this is how you flirt with apostasy. You decide that missing church one Sunday won't hurt you, so you miss one Sunday. Then the next Sunday you decide, well, I missed last Sunday and pretty tired this Sunday, so you don't go again. The third Sunday arrives and you rationalize, well, I've already missed two Sundays and there's still one more Sunday before the first Sunday, so I may as well stay home. The next Sunday comes and you say, oh, well, I've missed three Sundays and, and I can wait because next Sunday is communion. And before you know it, you've missed a month of Sundays. It kind of sneaks up on you. 
That's how it is when you're falling away from the truth. You do it a little bit at a time. You rationalize what you're doing. You make an excuse for what you're doing. You come up with some kind of explanation that you can buy and sell about why you are not doing what you know that you ought to be doing. And pretty soon, you get real good at this. You can explain and you can uh, come up with an excuse that sounds plausible. The problem is you have slipped away from what is the truth to what is a lie. See, there's no in between. Either you're telling the truth or you're not. Either you're living the life or you're not. There is no in between. Now, yeah, we're not going to always uh, do everything right. Sometimes we might fall down. But I'm talking about pressing toward the mark of the higher calling, which is in Christ Jesus. We want to be more like Christ. So we know that there are some things that we have to let go. We want to be more like Christ, so we want to know the truth, and so we study the word. We don't want to fall away from the truth. And we're so rooted and grounded and established in the truth that when somebody tells us something, we can tell the difference between what is true and what is false. And so we know false teachers when we see them and hear them. Jude is saying that some false teachers had gotten into the congregation and people were actually believing and following what they were saying. That is where we come in at. We have to know how to uh, contend for the faith and deal with apostasy. Now, there are three ways that people generally fall away from the faith. The first way is through temptations. The second way is through deception. The third way is through persecution, temptation. Christians are tempted to engage in various vices that were a part of their lives before they became Christian. Uh, for example, idolatry. Anything that you put before God or assign a greater value to or give a greater meaning to than God. That's idolatry. Sexual immorality. I don't have to explain it. You know what it is. You know who it is that you're not supposed to be messing with. If you out there messing with them, something will tell you one way or the other whether or not it's right or wrong. It's the little voice inside of your head that says, don't do that. And you make up your mind, either you are or you are not. Covetousness, wanting what someone else has so much that you hate. You hate. And you, and you want it so much that you hate that they have it. You cannot be genuinely happy for them. So... That's covenantsness. Deceptions. False teachers and false prophets come along spreading a new gospel, which threatens to seduce them away from their devotion in and to Jesus Christ. The followers of Jim Jones were deceived. And you can think of other cult-like situations where people have been deceived. Persecution. Christians who are threatened with certain death if they do not denounce the Jesus, the Christ. Um, 
it always fascinates me and gives me encouragement when people start to hate on me because of something that I believe or something that I won't do. I think about the disciples. Now, the Bible only records uh, how two of them died. But history uh, and, and, and other stories tell us how they all died. And I'm just going to go uh, through a list that I found uh, quickly. Peter and Paul. Paul was beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down at his request. Since he did not feel he was worthy to die in the same manner as his Lord. Andrew went to the land of the man-eaters where he has said to have been crucified. Uh, it's now modern day Soviet Union. Thomas was probably the most active in the area of East Syria. They claimed he died there when pierced through with the spears of four soldiers. Philip, in retaliation, um, well, let me say, Philip possibly had a po powerful ministry in Carthage in North Africa and then in Asia Minor, where he converted the wife of a Roman proconsul. In retaliation, the proconsul had Philip arrested and cruelly put to death. Matthew, uh, some of the oldest reports say he was not martyred, while others say he was stabbed to death in Ethiopia. Bartholomew, there are various accounts of how he met his death as a martyr for the gospel. James, the son of Alphaeus. Uh, the Jewish historian Josephus reported that he was stoned and then clubbed to death. Simon the Zealot was killed after refusing to sacrifice to the sun god, reportedly. Matthias, tradition sends him to Syria with Andrew and to death by burning. John is the only one who claims uh, who, who died a natural death. <clears throat> now, we haven't been persecuted like that, most of us. And so we should be able to stand up and say what we believe. Now, I want to go back to where we were in June. And we're going to talk today where we kind of left off. We had looked at the chiasm. We had looked at the chiasm. Uh, where is my paper? Here we go. And then we were looking at um, how they were being deceived. Now, the first groups that we looked at in the chiasm, and I've done a lot of work since then, and I've kind of filled my notes in a little bit with some more things that I could teach on, but I'm not at this point. I'm beginning to be really get into Jude. It's really beginning to get to be a deep book for me. So, um, um, I, I am really enjoying it. Now, we looked at the chiastic structure in three examples, Israel, angels, Sodom. And then we looked at the turning of the chiasm, likewise, also these filthy dreamers. And then we looked at it back with Sodom, angels, and Israel. And we looked at each group and what it meant. Then Jude goes on to look at some individuals. And one of the individuals I discussed last week, which was Korah, and I'm not going to re-discuss him, but it says, yet in the same way, these men, also by dreaming, defile the flesh, reject authority, and revile angelic majesty. 
Now, we know that they were talking about uh, Israel, uh, who uh, and then they talked about rejecting authority. They were talking about the angels. And then reviled angelic, um, ma uh, angelic majesties. They were talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. Those who defiled the flesh were the Israelites. Now let me see if I got that straight. Defiled the flesh, I have it backwards, which I thought. Did anybody catch that? No. Good. Okay, we're looking at a chiasm. Israel, the angels, and Sodom. Then you get the turning of the chiasm, which is likewise also these filthy dreamers, and then it goes backwards. Sodom defiled the flesh, angels despised dominion, and Israel and speak evil of dignitaries or dignities, and the angelic majesties. So they're turning around backwards. Israel, angels, Sodom, turning of the chiasm, filthy dreamers, defile the fresh, defile, de despise of dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Now, let us look at that so that we will uh, actually get what the apostasy is in each one of those groups and the principle that we are to associate with it. The first example is Israel. Israel. God's attitude toward apostasy is clear from the Bible. Jude gives three examples from the Old Testament of God's judgment on those who opposed his authority. The unfaithful Israelites in the wilderness, the fallen angels, and Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, when he gives those examples, he says, here's the principle that I want you to, to get. The ability to remember doctrine is crucial to Christian living. They knew what they did. Jude does not tell his readers something they did not know. They knew it, but had faded from their minds, making them vulnerable to apostasy. So, application. Remembrance is crucial in Christian thought. We forget so quickly. That's why precept must be on precept, line upon line, here a tittle, there a tittle. We have to have reminders. We must remember. That's why we must study the word. It, 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 it says, my soul look back and wonder. Your soul shouldn't have to wonder about how you got over. You should remember how you got over and praise God because if you don't remember that it was God that brought you through you might attribute it to something else you might attribute it to your good luck or to your good job or to uh, somebody gave you some money out of the blue or to anything else except God your soul should not have to look back and wonder how you got over here Judy said don't forget what brought you through, Israelites. Uh, remember that it was God that brought you through, Egypt. Remember, don't forget. So we want to keep in mind what we are supposed to be remembering. And then we get to the further description of the ungodly men in verse 8. Yet in the same way, these men also by dreaming defiled the flesh, reject authority, and revile angelic majesties. Jude now turns his three illustrations of apostasy in the Old Testament to describe four earmarks of apostates in his own day. And here are the four earmarks. Number one. I'm having a little trouble with my eyes. I'm trying to get through it. Number one. 
They live in the unreal world of dreams. They, they, since they do not live in objectivity and in imagination, they do not face reality. They live in dream world. How many people do you know that live in dream world that can't seem to face reality? That's the beginning of apostasy. You must know the truth and the truth will set you free. As long as you keep making an excuse for the truth, you will never be free. You have to admit to yourself what the real deal is. Secondly, the second earmark is of apostates is they defile the flesh. The word defile occurs only in our passage and in Titus 1.15, in Hebrews 12, 15. Defile means contaminate, stain, corrupt. The, 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 the best example that I can give of this is when you are, are ordained and they hand you your certificate and they say, here is the seal of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. Don't stain it with your life. Don't stain it with your life. Don't do something that's going to take away from your witness as a Christian. Uh, I just let a few curse words slip. Okay? You let them slip. Ask God to not let you let them slip no more. Because blessings and cursings can't come out of the same mouth. You have now stained your witness with somebody. I heard the, the preacher cussing up a storm. They not going to want to hear what I have to say about God. I'm cussing up a storm. I have now stained my witness. And I am causing somebody to fall away. I am polluting myself so that I cannot be a good witness to somebody else. Number three, the third earmark of apostasy is rejection of authority. The word reject means to thwart the efficacy of anything, to nullify, to make void, to frustrate. Authority is dominion and has the idea of constituted authority. In other words, God is telling us something to do, and we don't do it. God says, go here, and we say, oh, I'll do that later, and we don't do it ever. When God says, go here, he don't mean for you to make up your mind when to go. He means for you to go. And you can ask him, God, do you mean for me to go now or later? God will tell you. But you have to act in obedience. This is not Burger King lifestyle. You cannot have it your way. You need to have it his way. Why? Because he is sovereign. He knows the plans he has for you. He knows what's coming. He knows how you gonna get out of your situation even before your situation occurs. He knows that you are never gonna walk along through this situation because he's never gonna leave you or, 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 or forsake you. And so if he is walking with you and holding your hand, he's gonna lead you and guide you in the path in which you are to go. So when you reject his authority, you are leaning towards apostasy. And fourth, is that they disparage authority, speak evil of dignitaries. These apostates love to slander dignitaries. Now, God is not a respecter of person. Titles should not mean anything to you. I'm going to respect this person because of their title. 
Now you're going to respect this person because they are a human being made in the image of God. And you're going to show them the love of God because God is love. When you start to uh, speak evil of people, you start falling away. Um, I, I know your mama said to you at one point in time, if you don't have nothing good to say, don't say nothing at all. Many of us, cause other people to fall away from the church by the things we say about other folk. Uh, the pastor. Talk about the pastor. I'm not going to that church. She said, and she's a member. Uh, you talk about uh, your neighbor. Well, the neighbor may not know God, but you do. If you can't help them, don't talk about them. Pray for them. Do something positive. Your witness depends on it. Your witness depends on it. We want to, one of the best uh, things that somebody ever said to me as a lawyer was they said to me, I loved when you are appointed to me as a lawyer. And I said, why? They said, because you treat me like a human being. I thought to myself, I treat everybody like a human being. But then I realized that she must have had some experience where because she was behind bars or because she was charged with something that that was, you know, a little out there, or uh, because she might have been using some kind of drugs, or because she might not have been dressed right, because whatever the reason, somebody at some point in time had made her feel less than human. You can't win nobody to Christ when they feel less than human. In fact, folk fall away from the church when they come to the church and they feel like they aren't treated right. There is nothing worse than a church hurt. Folk come to church hurting and they are looking for some type of healing and wholeness when they arrive. If we don't treat them like children of God, brothers and sisters in Christ, whether they are brothers and sisters in Christ or not, we need to treat them with love and respect and not be a respecter of person. Then maybe we can draw others. Because Christ here said, if he be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. But he has no hands except our hands, my mama used to say. No feet except our feet. No tongue except our tongue. Everything we do and say reflects Christ to that particular person. We are his image. We are his reflection. People, some people will only know Christ by our actions. So then we get to the point in uh, Jude where we can look at a bigger chiasm. A, those of you who have been with me before, kind of know where I'm going. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then it's going to go backwards. F, E, D, C, B, A. So, let's look at it. A, they address the beloved in verse 3. B, 
ungodly people have come in long ago designated. Verse 4. C. He says, I want to remind you in verse 5. D. The Lord and judgment is in also in verse 5, the latter part. E. He has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness. Verse 6. F. These people blaspheme or against God. Eight. Then we get to a key, a turnaround point. Michael did not blaspheme against the devil, but appealed God's word. Then we have F. These people blaspheme, verse 10. E, the gloom, E prime rather, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved for them, verse 13. D, the Lord in judgment, verse 14. C, you must remember, verse 17. B, it was predicted ungodly people will come in, 17 through 18. And then you have the address to the beloved, verse 20. So you have the whole book laying out the themes. And then it gets to a turnaround point or pivotal point. It says, Michael did not blaspheme against the devil, but appealed God's word. And then we continue to see the reflected themes. God wants to make sure that we understand his word. So he says it, turns around, and says it again. The turnaround point is the main point of the text. So let us take a closer look at verse 9. Going back to Jude. right before Revelation. And we get to verse, and it says, Jude, yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring himself bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, here's the example that we are to follow. Why would the illustration of Michael and the devil be central to the parallel? Why would it be the turnaround point, the main point that, that Jude is trying to make? Uh, the men who have crept in are not submitting to the word or to the church. They are criticizing the church and they are twisting the grace of God to serve their own ends. Remember that word licentiousness that we looked up? They are twisting the grace of God to serve their own ends. They are rejecting God's authority. They ultimately place themselves in a place of judgment over God and his people. The, their rejection of authority and their blasphemies are contrasted to Michael's submission to God's authority. First point, Michael is submitting to God's authority. He's not rejecting it. He's not running away from it. He's not rebelling. He's not trying to find a way out. He's not trying to make an excuse. He's not trying to make himself look better than he is with some kind of a lie as to what he is before God. He is submitting to God. So, despite his high position, Michael does not even speak against the devil as boldly as these men speak. Even the archangel does not presume to exercise his own judgment or authority as do these men. 
the centrality of Christ and his authority are therefore emphasized by Michael's example of pronouncing God's word rather than speaking from his own authority. This is precisely what these men failed to do and why they will be judged. They've rejected God's authority. They speak boldly stuff they don't know, false teachings. They've taken God out of it. They're saying, do what you want to do. Have your own way. And folk are falling for it. And they're going to be judged accordingly. Now, let's stop for a minute. And let's pause. And let's take a really good look at ourselves. Is everything in our life in total submission to God? Is the way that we handle money in total submission to God? Do we tithe first? Do we... Uh, Pay our bills first. Which one is God asking us to do? Do we treat everybody like we would want to be treated? Or even better than we are treated? Do we show love to our fellow man? Are we living the life that we preach about, talk about, witness about? Or can they see that we one way on Friday and another way on Sunday and another way on Monday Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. They don't know which face we gonna be wearing. The, the, the first thing that it says in the Shema is here, O Israel, our God is one. God is one way all the time. He never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What about us? Integrity means that we are whole, that we have one way of doing things. We have some integrity about ourselves. We look the same today and tomorrow in the way that we act, in the way that we behave, in the way that we talk. How does our life style line up with the word of God? Are there things that we know that we know that we know that we are doing wrong? But we think nobody knows about it. Or I've been doing this for a long time. It's a part of me. I, I can't give this up. That's a lie. Straight from the pit of hell. Because what you are saying is God can't do all things. God cannot do the impossible. You are saying that the habit that you have is greater than God's ability to relieve you of that habit. That's a lie. God can do all things you can do all things through Christ which strengthens you that's the word have you fallen away a little bit from the truth or are you completely in line with the truth what you say is in line with what you do. No matter what the circumstances. If you would tell the truth over here. Then you would tell the truth over there. 
Can your family members actually count on you to be who you say you are at all times? Under all circumstances, no matter what happens? Can your church count on you? Some of us, and, and me too, need to take a second look at our lives. And I'm sure we'll find places where we're not quite where we want to be. And those are the places in our lives where people can creep in unawares. Circumstances can creep in unawares and slowly pull you away. I don't pray like I ought to. Daniel prayed three times a day. Can I not find one time a day that I can pray and pray in earnestness? Am I that busy? Busy being under Satan's yoke. Am I that busy that I cannot find time to stop and pray? Can I, can I not find time to, to spend time in the Word on a daily basis? If I can't find time to spend time in the Word on a daily basis for five minutes, for five minutes, then I am too busy being under Satan's yoke. I miss church every once in a while, they say. Okay, you miss your opportunity when you miss church to come and fellowship with the saints and be encouraged and hear the testimony of somebody that says, it's all right, I was here, but now I'm here to be encouraged and lifted up and to know that God can do and that God is not a respecter of persons. We fall away from the Christian truths because Satan is busy. He's always prowling around seeking whom he can devour. What can I tempt her with today? How can I deceive her today? How can I make her haters and backstabbers come out against her today in such a way that she just throw up her hands in there? My strength comes from the Lord. And every day, every hour, we need him. It's not just a song that we sing on Sunday. We need him, for in him we move and have our being. This is where we start to just fall away. Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, and that's what we do. We fight with the devil every day. Ephesians 6 says we fight not against flesh and blood. Turn to it. It's a familiar passage of scripture. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Ephesians, the sixth chapter. It says, beginning at the 10th verse, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in his power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles which tricks of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers 
of darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, which which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to, to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. That says a mouthful. And I wasn't going to do this today, but I prepared it. So let me just simply say it. This is the truth that you need to hear. Jesus is the ultimate defender of the faith. Jesus did not have to gird his loins with the truth. He was the truth, the way, and the life. No man could come under Father except through him. He did not have to put on the breastplate of righteousness because 1 Corinthians 1 and 30 declares that Jesus Christ is our righteousness. Jesus did not have to shod his feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Jesus is the gospel of peace. For John 14 and 27 reads, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Jesus is our good news. He died, but he is not dead. He is yet alive. He arose for you and for me. That is the good news. The truth is, he did not have to take up the shield of faith. Because Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. The substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. He did not have to put on the helmet of salvation. Because Jesus is our salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Jesus did not have to take the sword of the spirit because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the father, full of grace and full of truth. This is my faith. This is what I believe. This is why I preach the word and I am ready in season and out of season to repute, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. I am going to preach as a dying man to dying men. This is the faith that I believe and stay on the battlefield ready to defend until the day that the last trump sounds for me and I close my eyes when it is all over down here. And you can't hear me sing the songs of Zion anymore. I want to open my eyes and see the face of Jesus and hear him say, you can hear me preach the word of God again. I just want to hear Jesus say, you have fought the good fight. You have finished the course. You have kept the faith. 
And now there is laid up for you the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And you stand up for Jesus. Fight the good fight. Defend the faith then you too will be able to join him at that great meeting and get your crown, put on your shoes, and walk around God's heaven all day. There's a song. That I like to sing. And it says, I want to be holy thine. I don't want to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't want to be like the angels. I don't want to be like Israel. I want to be like Michael. Submitting to God's authority. At all times. In all places under all circumstances no matter what happens I want to keep the faith the whole faith and nothing but the faith I want to speak the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth Jude is giving a stinging indictment of those that believe he said you let somebody creep in among you and take what you know that you know that you know that you know is the truth away from you. Listen. Even though we study about chiasms and we study about all kinds of other stuff, the point is to know the word. To be able to put on the whole armor every single day. And not just put it on, but know how to use the armor. Know how to use your sword. Know how to use your shield. Know how to use your breastplate. The point is for you to be able to stand up for Jesus no matter where you are and defend and contend for the faith. Know what you believe. And the only way that you gonna know what you believe is to study the word. To submit to God's authority. God is not out to hurt you. God's plans for you are better than any plan that you could have for yourself. His plan is to prosper you and not do you harm. I invite you today. If you know that you are 
in the church and you've been slipping and sliding and ducking and dodging and you ain't quite living the life able to stand up and look God in the eye if he was to come today and say listen Lord I confess that I haven't done everything I ought to do confession simply means that you agree with God God already knows that you're gonna mess up that's why he sent his son Jesus the Christ to die in your place that the blood that he shed might wash away your sins not that you can continue to do it over and over and over and over again not so you can be licentious but so you can appreciate the grace of God and the gift, the free gift that he has given to you. That's what Jude is telling us. That is what Jude is telling us. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we come now with our heads bowed and our hearts humbled. And we ask, Lord, that you would look inside of us. We are opening ourselves up, Father God, as if we were laying on a table and somebody was performing surgery on us. And indeed you are, because Ezekiel said that you will take out our old stony heart and replace it with a heart of flesh. Father God, perform open heart surgery on us today that we might be given your heart so that we might have your desires, so that we might follow your will, so that we might walk in the truth, live in the truth, and show the truth of God to somebody who does not know it yet. Whose life is full of lies and deceptions, temptations and persecutions. And let them know that you are God and that you came because you love them so that they wouldn't have to go through all of these situations and circumstances and changes that they're going through now. All by themselves. But you have promised never to leave us nor forsake us. And there is nothing like having you walk with us on a daily basis. Talk with us and lead us and guide us in the way that we should go. We don't want to fall away. If there be something in our lives, Father God, where we're not living right. Where we putting on a show for somebody else, Father. We ask, Lord, that, that you call that pretense out. That fakeness, that hypocrisy out. And remind us that we supposed to look like you. Represent you. And be your image in this world. Help us, Father God to press toward the mark of the higher calling to be the best possible image that we can be. In Jesus' name, we do pray. Amen. Remember, be safe. Practice social distancing. Wash your hands and pray. Until this time next week, remember God loves you. And so do I.